So, welcome everybody to the rebranded Perspectives in Global Development Seminar Series. My name is Ed Mabaya, and I'm actually smiling under this mask. So <laughs> Good to see everybody in person, finally. So, uh, I'm one of the uh, instructors and co-chairs for the seminar series. And let me just start off with a few housekeeping issues. For those that are coming in now, if you can kindly make it your seat. So the first housekeeping issue is that we have people joining online, and I would want to ask those people that if you can keep your camera off, the technology we have here is such that we want to profile the main speaker. And if you can keep your camera off, maybe until the Q&A session, if you need to turn it back on. Second announcement, if you are taking uh, this class for credit, a student, please make sure you fill in the attendance, uh, either online or in person while you're here. And uh, this seminar now is also open to uh, people beyond the Cornell community. So please spread the word to your family, friends, uh, relatives, and yeah, they're more than welcome to attend this every week. And it's also being recorded. We want to see you here in person, but please feel free to share some of these talks that will be posted online uh, following the uh, recording. Kindly keep you and your questions until the end. Uh, we will have a, hopefully a very robust uh, Q&A discussion. So if you can hold on to your questions until the end of the presentation, that'll be good. And last housekeeping issue, uh, due to new COVID restrictions, we cannot serve food or you cannot have food here. We had prepared a smorgasbord of food that was supposed to be there at the back, and I can't wait for the time when they allow us to serve you nice, delicious food in here as well. We try to keep everybody happy. So, without further ado, we have a very fantastic lineup of speakers this semester representing private sector, government, philanthropy, research institutions, academia. And I'm delighted today, I'm with my great honor to be introducing our speaker who's going to kick us off on this seminar series this fall semester. And that is uh, the Vika, again, I hope I'm saying your name right, uh, who she's an entrepreneurial development professional with more than two decades of nonprofit and public-private partnership experience in the United States, United Kingdom, and India. Some of her high-level accomplishments are already detailed in the bio that was given to you. I'm sure you'd rather hear from her than from me, so I'll keep this introduction very brief. She currently serves as the Director of Philanthropy at Health in Harmony, where she leads and directs the grants, fundraising, blended finance, marketing, communications, to accelerate the organization's growth to meet the urgency the climate crisis. Can't think of a better person to kick us off uh, on this uh, seminar series. She holds uh, she also serves on the board of the National Federation of Business and Professional Women. She holds a master's in city planning from MIT and a master's in arts in economics from Bombay University. She's here today to talk to us about how we can regenerate rainforests by listening to communities. Without further ado, help me welcome our speaker today, Davika Adel. I'm going to take this as my cue to start talking. Uh, it's a shame that you don't have food. I, that was my favorite part about seminars, but I guess that's the world of COVID. So as Ed kindly introduced me, I'm Devika, and I'm here to talk about Health and Harmony's disruptive planetary health model that recognizes the link between human and environmental health. I think COVID-19 has you know, brought it home like nothing else that we have vital ties between human health and the health of animals and the health of our planet. To address these concerns, while we must heed scientific methods, we at Health and Harmony have always believed that you must take into account the knowledge of the indigenous people. Indigenous people, as we know, make up only 5% of the world's population yet they protect around 80% of the world's biodiversity. And together, they manage 25% of the Earth's land surface and a third of the carbon stored in the tropical forests. So 
I always like to give you a summary of the organization. So what is Health in Harmony? It's an international nonprofit. We have a unique award-winning formula that currently protects 8.8 million hectares of tropical rainforest globally in Indonesia, Brazil, and Madagascar. Our approach actually works at the intersection of health and climate and covers 12 of 17 UN SDGs. All our staff are national citizens and work alongside 135,000 local indigenous and traditional people. Where COVID stopped a lot of the world's firms and organizations from working, our work actually grew and expanded. And currently we are looking to in increase our reforestation efforts and to scale up rapidly. So what are we about? So, and what is this planetary health mission? So our mission, that was the title slide that I put up, which was to reverse tropical rainforest deforestation for planetary health. So what is planetary health? I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It's a relatively new concept, which kind of originated around 2015. And for the first time, recognize that the health of human civilization and natural systems on which it depends is together defined as planetary health. We've been doing this since 2006. We've always believed in breaking down barriers. We've always believed that ecological conservation and urgent climate needs, they need to be addressed through an integrated initiative that looks at women's empowerment educational training, alternate livelihoods, because you cannot achieve, you know, without healthy people, you won't have a healthy forest and you won't have a healthy planet. So, I mean, look at this beautiful orangutan. I mean, imagine that drone taking his picture, but today rainforest loss really accounts for 78% of all land-based greenhouse gas emissions. Nearly every ecosystem on the planet is in jeopardy of collapsing as we are destroying nature and driving global heating. So it's, we really, humanity, we've created these existential crises, right? The lifestyle that many of us have enjoyed, that's created the climate crisis, that's engineered the collapse of nature as we know it. And as rainforest disappears, so do thousands of plants and animal species. So as you'll see from this report by Project Drawdown and others, you know, there are many ways we can stop it, but tropical rainforests, just preserving them is one of the most effective and least expensive ways to mitigate global heating. So majority of, what is interesting is that the majority of the rainforest loss is actually not due to commercial scale clear cutting. It's due to local fire, fire events and local community oriented degradation. And that's mainly because the tropical rainforest communities across the globe face grinding impoverishment, including the lack of access to basic needs like healthcare and food security. So while they're the experts in knowing how to preserve our systems, they're often left with no choice but to log or mine rainforests, you know, to get the cash to make ends meet. And consistently across the tropics, we find that the biggest drivers for rainforest loss and destruction is the cost of healthcare and medical emergencies. I mean, I'm a mother. If my child is sick, I do anything to get to the hospital system, right? To pay for that healthcare. And people all over the world are no different. So what is this health and harmony model? So this is where we really came in because our starting point is that we are not the experts. We completely understand that, we acknowledge that, and we understand that the leadership and the expertise of the local and indigenous rainforest communities is vital. And we recognize that we need to develop the, they need to develop the solutions in which we need to invest precisely in. So how do we do it? We developed a technology or a methodology, if, I, if you will, called radical listening, which is basically we start by asking the people a very simple question and say, you are the guardians of this precious rainforest that is valuable to the earth. How might the world community assist you to live in balance with this rainforest as a thank you for your guardianship? 
So with that, we listen to them sometimes for hundreds of hours, documenting their solutions, you know, which is across the tropics consistently, interestingly, now that we've done it for a while, some combination of improved healthcare access and job streaming. Really, that's all they want. And then we are committed to investing after we've finished the radical listening to investing precisely in their systems oriented solutions. What does, this is what a radical listening looks like for us. Where we sit there, we talk to them for you know, hundreds and thousands of hours. In COVID, we've done it remotely. We've done it via WhatsApp. We've installed internet points and done it. But yes, throughout is always their solutions, their ideas. And yes, we now know kind of where they land at, but it's always engineered and designed by them. So it always comes down to healthcare, access to healthcare, um, you know, alternate livelihood training, which is really agroforestry, reforestation, agriculture training, because they're still doing slash and burn. So that is where we can invest precisely and help them, you know, get more from the same land. And they all want education, whether it's basic education or planetary health education. So with that, I share a visual to you. So what is slightly different is that is in the, in the top left corner is a photo of our hospital in Indonesia, in uh, Sukadana. And the way we, we don't provide the healthcare for free, we basically say that in lieu of cash, we will accept a non-cash payment, which could be handicrafts, seedlings, rice husks, manure, or, or you know, they just come and help and work in the facility. And the more families that are doing one of these, and not logging, the lower is that payment. So that's really the model after radical listening. And, and we sign agreements. And so, you know, communities agree that they will protect the forest in return for this um, healthcare. So I actually got a little video now. I'm, I'm not sure if this will share. So unplug here and see if I can play this for you. Madagascar is well known for the richness of its biodiversity. As you go through the islands, you met a lot of different types of ecosystems from the north to the south. Today, we're going to bring you into a trip to the southeast, precisely in Manubu Special Reserve, a 5,800 hectare protected area on Madagascar's southeastern coast. We listen to the community because we believe that they are the expert to preserve this forest. During the different radical listening session, the are community you able to see my video? access to healthcare, agriculture, so rest oh, cultivation. I'm sorry. Here I was thinking education. you could see my video. We continue the radical listening process only hear the audio. To the community oh. who are the experts on how the healthcare services My will apologies. Be Let me stop the video. So. And resume the share. So, well, that's a shame I can't share that with you. I wanted to show you in, um, from Madagascar, our teams in Madagascar had put together a, a lovely video, which actually shows our um, model. I, I'm not able to share my screen again. Okay. Ask screen share. Oh, it's it's not allowing me to share my share my screen anymore. Hold on one second. Somebody is looking at it now. And if you can send us a link a link to the recording afterwards, we'll share with everybody. Super. Thank you about that. Can you try again to share your screen? Yes. And I'm back. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Let me just put this back in presentation mode. So yes, um, we'll, we'll share the video at a later time. So Thank I'm you. Try and click through. So we expanded to, and I'll just say this here. So we we had a proof of concept site in Indonesia. We started in the Gulpanag National Forest, 
in 2006 through our radical listening methodology and the community agreements, right? The reciprocity agreements that we signed with the communities there. And after 10 years of you know, doing that in 2017, Stanford University did an impact analysis of the first 10 years of data from our proof of concept site in Borneo, which were published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in November, 2020. What it showed us was quite phenomenal that our $5.2 million investment over a 10 year period had yielded outstanding results. We, we saw a 90% drop in illegal logging households, right? And when that happened, a 65 million uh, in, in, uh, in carbon was protected above ground carbon as the primary uh, you know, forest loss was stabilized, that 5.2 million yielded 65 million in above ground protected carbon, which also then allowed 21,000 hectares of secondary forest to regrow, which in turn then protected 3,000 critically endangered Bornean orangutans. Meanwhile, in terms of health, phenomenal health impact, 67% drop in infant mortality in that clinic's catchment of 1,000 people. And there were also significant declines over time in diagnosed cases of malaria, tuberculosis, and diabetes. So if I put this in perspective for you, if Gulbanag National Forest had been logged and burned, which could have continued happening had we not intervened, the amount of carbon dioxide emitted into the Earth's atmosphere would have been the same as 14 years worth of carbon dioxide from the city of San Francisco. So. We trusted the people's wisdom, right? We didn't engineer this. We didn't do any of this. That's what they told us we should do. So we listened to them. We trusted their wisdom. And they naturally designed a new kind of health system, right? Which connected their own well being to that of the rainforest. So, I mean, our work basically demonstrated a very actionable framework, which met, meets 12 or 17 you know, sustainable development goals of the United Nations, because again, rainforest communities never design siloed solutions. They always de design interconnected solutions which are deeply interconnected and which then naturally address multiple targets, all of which leveraging basically that radical listening approach, which is listening to them and investing precisely in their wisdom. More than anything, honestly, it's a story of hope. Right? It is a story of restoring agency to the experts, the experts of protecting nature, because they've been doing it for centuries and they've been doing it right. And it's a story of transferring global wealth back into these communities, because that's really what we did through our program. So since then, we expanded to another site in Indonesia, in Bukit Baka, Bukit Raya National Park. We started the radical listening process in Madagascar in Minumbu Special Reserve uh, in 2019 and the, actually started the program in 2020 during the height of COVID. And then we went to Brazil, to the Amazon, to the Midland, the Shingu River Basin. And we went there in 2020. And when we went there, they said, you must be mad. You mustn't do this. This is wrong. So of course we thought that that means that's right. That's the correct indicator that we must do this. And we haven't looked back. So I shared a few quick slides with you, which is, you know, yes, it is three locations. What is our mission? You know, we've achieved a lot since then. We've continued to grow. Um, you know, Madagascar already in a year has nine seedling nurseries, which has then resulted in planting three hectares of, you know, forests. I don't know if you followed the famine crisis in Madagascar this year, which is very severe and which is really, really becoming a problem. But at least in our region, I'm proud to say that the communities have, you know, they've come together. We are now planting fruit trees, a hostile land where they used to get one rice crop a year is now going to yield them three rice crops in the year because, because of the buns and because of the, you know, technology we've invested in with them in, in cultivation. We've, you know, we've restored 16 schools four of which have been used as healthcare sites, um, you know, through which we've, we've managed to conduct 1,170 patient visits. And this is also our already outdated data because you know, 
it's constantly coming back in from the field. And again, our model is not about us going there and doing it. It's very anti-colonial. So we work with them and the staff. It's, it's community members are trained to be the experts, to give the advice, to man the healthcare clinics and to reach out to the communities. In Brazil, in the Shingu River Basin, our program looks slightly different. So though the communities have revealed they need the same things, in Brazil, the COVID crisis was severe. And the communities there, you know, every time they would leave their homes to get healthcare, land grabbers, illegal gra land grabbers would go in and, and clean their lands. So they didn't want to get healthcare. They didn't want to leave their land. So their ask was different. Their ask was, you know, give us healthcare, bring it to us, uh, you know, bring us emergency evacuation. And so that we don't have to leave, leave our land and so we can protect it from the land grabbers. They already understand they have great forest products. Our mission is to help them get their forest products you know, to a better economy, right? So in Brazil, we've done lots of um, uh, vaccination missions already. And there's one out right now. I think our fifth COVID vaccination mission is out there. So I, I captured some photos from you for you. That boat is actually a vaccination mission in case you're wondering what a vaccination mission in the Shingu looks like. So we load up the boat, we have solar panels on them so that the heat can power our generator which carries the vaccines. And we go by boat and many of the vaccinations happen on the boat. So if you see, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the bottom left screen, this man is catching his fish because that's so important, right? While, while our nurse is sticking the COVID vaccine in his arm. So, you know, it takes, all different kinds of missions. Uh, but these are possible because the communities trust us. A lot of it is not about just getting the vaccinations there, right? It is about the communities trusting the providers, trusting us to do the right thing by them. So I didn't want to keep talking. So I did bring it to you know what's next for us. Um, you know, we are expanding. We never do this alone. Our model isn't a model where we think we know it all. It is community led, which means if there are local partners, which typically there are, or sometimes there aren't, we always partner with them. So in Brazil, you know, I listed all, you know, Center Valbio, uh, Amoreri, Amora Max, the traditional indigenous communities, ISA, which is Instituto Societo Ambiental, the Federal University of Para. We, we are partnered with all of them because Brazil is not a place where you want to, you know, where you go and say, oh, I'm going to do this myself, right? If you want to achieve an impact and you want to be meaningful, you need to find the partners. Um, in, yeah, you know, internationally, we are talking to Doctors Without Borders because they are primed for emergency healthcare, but they don't think of planetary health. So we are trying to talk to them to see if, you know, we can provide them the planetary health approach. Um, you know, WHO just published our um, model actually as a model case study uh, for Madagascar as an acceptable and as one of the modern solutions for providing uh, a planetary health solution to the crisis. And then we've always believed in data and metrics. So all these schools you see listed here, we've partnered with them for either providing technical know-how. So with Yale, we had a, a partnership where the doctors would go and learn from the local shamans in Indonesia and then train them in some of the modern medical techniques. Because again, the idea is not to do a one-off, right? The idea is to empower the communities so that they can themselves address their needs in perpetuity. So we're not creating show models which are dependent on us. Our plan is to scale and scale rapidly. Our plan is to give away this model, give away the radical listening tool to anybody who wants it. So we are investing in a digital platform through which you know we can, we're working, it's, it's like a three-part platform. So today, interestingly for me, because I always thought, you know, technology is super advanced. I mean, we keep landing people on the moon. But all data, including the, um, you can, you see data in with a lag of one month. So if there's a forest fire, if there is a problem, the data has a severe lag. So we are partnering with Woodwell. They're the people who have helped create all the NASA maps to create a zoomed out model where we can actually see in lifetime the interventions that are happening in the forest. People can see in lifetime. So it's also kind of like, a, um, you know, a global giving platform where communities can put up their projects, providers can, you know, and 
can bid for those projects, communities can rate them, like you rate on Uber or one of the food platforms, like on a Yelp, you can give a rating. But at the same time, people can see in lifetime the things which are happening. So that's one of the other prongs we are doing so that that way will enable us to train more people to share the information and to give it away really, that's our grand plan. And then we've realized the power of advocacy. Um, you know, COVID happened, a lot of models came out, but people are not talking about a pandemic prevention fund yet. So we've partnered with a lot of coalition members, which have some of the leading bingos, um, which include the World Resource Institute, the World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, Rainforest Alliance. So all of us came together and we formed the Prevention of Pandemics at the Source Coalition. And again, I'm, I'm hyperlinked all of this and I would be more than happy to share it. And, and the, the role of the coalition is really to constantly talk about and to lobby the government to make them aware that we need to create a fund. We cannot have another COVID-19. I mean, these pandemics have been happening. We've been ignoring them. Now, in every, you know, every time it happens, it's bigger. It's at a grander scale. So we need to work now to prevent a future, right? Uh, and we need to have that fund ready today. So I'll end with just saying that the health of our planet and our future, it really depends on the knowledge, the wisdom, and the strength of the local communities. And we have to learn from them, listen to them, and invest precisely in their knowledge. And that is really the winning formula for stopping future pandemics. So I'm going to stop my share so I can see a little bit more of you and enable you all to ask me questions. Thank you so very much. With that, I would like to open the floor for Q&A. Uh, so if you can just raise your hand and I'll get to you and get the microphone to you. Hi, my name is Nazra. I'm an undergraduate senior. Thank you for coming to speak with us today. Uh, my first question is, it's kind of a two-part question, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned that you guys build healthcare facilities and the services are not free, but the community members can pay in other ways through seats and such, which I thought was really interesting. Um, my question is, the first part is, how are the hospitals able to be funded through the resources that the community members are paying with? And then my second question is, why not provide free health care in exchange for the community's environmental protection efforts and their community designed and led innovations? Thank you for your question, Nazra. So, so one part, and that's why we are a nonprofit, because we do believe that a, you know, it's time that the world transferred funds back to the communities, right? Uh, and I started by saying that though these communities are 5% of the world and they protect, you know, significant 25% of the world's resources, our starting point is that we do need to transfer. So the hospitals, the staff, and a lot of the work we do is funded through philanthropic efforts, right? So we fundraise here. Now, uh, we, are, we are registered in, in the United States. Uh, and really, I some people call us the headquarters. I call us the back office processing unit. So we provide the support services so the programs team in these communities can do their job, right? So we fundraise and we transfer funds to them. So that's really how they're funded. And in most cases, we don't necessarily form a hospital in, in Indonesia. In Sukudana, we did because that was the need back then. And in, um, in Madagascar, we are, you know, it's more mobile clinics because we are working with the local government there. In Indonesia, the reason we had to form the hospital was that the nearest government hospital, and we partner with them, honestly, and we are actually partnering with them for the COVID relief effort, which, which is affecting Indonesia at this point, uh, is that it's really far away. So it takes them almost four days to reach that hospital. So the need was to have this facility you know, where, where people in Sukudana, in Gulpanag National Forest, in Bukit Bakka, Bukit Raya could access it. And the point from which we could send out the mobile clinics. In Madagascar, the main hospital is close enough, so we operate more through mobile clinics, which I've shown you, which could look like a tent, which can look like a boat. So uh, it's not a permanent structure. So it, you know, just enables us to meet the needs of a wider population. 
The second part is why not provide free healthcare, right? So our whole model is integrated. Many of these people, um, and I should have probably included some of the chainsaw photographs, right? So these people were logging, right? They were logging because logging provide, that's all they knew how to do, right? Logging provided them the money to meet the needs of their families. They didn't know what else. So we instituted programs like chainsaw buyback program, right? We've also, um, uh, you know, included uh, things like goats for widows program, where, where we will give them. We're doing agricultural training. So a lot of the whole program is designed such that it's not about the money, but it is about also retraining them and their families and the women for an alternate livelihood. And free healthcare, we've tried doing it, the system breaks down because then there is no incentive for them to move away from what they know to what they would like it to be. So if you want to win the whole community over and if you want them to work with you, then the reciprocity agreements are, are very, very important. And that's what our finding shows. So, so which is why it's a, it's a unique blend of it's not about the money, but it's about the agreement, right? So that's why I shared with you, you could, you could give me plants, you could give me food, you could give me fruits, anything goes, but then it's an exchange of equals. They don't feel they're taking a free service. And it's also us honoring them and respecting them, right? We, we are giving them the agency and they feel good about it. So does that, does that answer your question? I don't want to keep talking and, and take away time. She's nodding ahead. I assume that she agrees. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Horace, a grad student in natural resources. Uh, my question uh, relates to the presentation in the sense that uh, I saw an aspect of government involvement quite of missing or consp conspicuously missing. But for sustainability, it will be very good to see how you influence policy at local levels. And so that what you're doing in a micro scale can also be uh, expanded on a macro scale for more impact. And then secondly, uh, maybe, uh, do you have any experiences of indigenous knowledge in the conservation of resources? Because as it comes out, it seems as if the local communities are more of uh, exploiting the resources to their detriment. Uh, don't they have some forms of uh, conservation that have existed within the communities over time? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Horace. Um, so I, I think I, I didn't explain this well. Um, so it's my, no, every country we work in, we are definitely working with the government. Uh, so, and I can, I should have backtracked and shared that. So, because without the, you're absolutely right. If you don't have government partnership, it's going to be a one-off agreement. Now, sometimes it's harder to reach that. And sometimes we start top down because the government is fully in favor. So government itself is a complicated structure, right? There is a national government and there's the local government. So for instance, in, in Madagascar, the national government, the local government, everybody is on board. They, in fact, like it's liked our plan for COVID so much that they wanted us to do it for the whole of Madagascar. And we just didn't have the ability. So, you know, we, we created the, um, you know, informational sessions for them and the advertisements and everything. Um, but yes, we are working with them to see how we can scale up and scale out. In Brazil, the Bolsonaro government uh, doesn't even acknowledge that this is happening. So it is a very different thing. Having said that, uh, you know, the Amoredi and Amoramax and all of them are local partnerships. We talk to the local health secretaries, they're very on, very much on board. The local business associations, the local universities is all, I mean, the whole thing is completely focused and we're working in partnership with them. In Indonesia, when we started back then, it was a mixed bag because a lot of the, uh, areas we are working in, they're all parts of the national forest and, and the catchment areas outside the forest, right? So we, in fact, we are now very much tied with them. So we just actually worked with uh, uh, one of our um, foundation partners to send uh, successfully se send shipments of uh, uh, you know, oxygen tanks and oxygen concentrators to Indonesia. 
and to the government and then to the local hospital. And we've been sharing all our supplies and knowledge. So it is very much a partnership. I would just say that it is at different levels depending on the level of acceptance. And sometimes acceptance is quick and sometimes you know, it takes time. To your second part of the question, uh, local communities definitely have the knowledge and that is, that is why it is our starting point. They have the knowledge, they have the skills, they have everything. It is just that over time, as their land has been, you know, uh, taken away, as as they face poverty and they face lack of options, they they have had to resort to logging and other issues. So we recognize that. So that is why the whole radical listening is around listening to them and helping them find the solution so that they can once again, and again being the critical word, once again live in harmony. Right? They were living in harmony. You know, if they weren't and if they didn't have fantastic solutions, we wouldn't have these amazing forests because they've been living here far before we created modern ways and cities and everything. So they have the solutions. We respect and completely understand that. And all we are doing is now helping them restore agency so that they can once again use their solutions. Right. So a lot of their solutions uh, are, you know, they will never do single plantation, right? They will always do multiples. They will always plant native species. In fact, it's us outsiders when we talk of planting that we go and do massive plantations, which is really not good. When the natives create a solution, they say, oh, we must plant fruit trees. We must do these ones and that one. And honestly speaking, that is the right solution because that then creates the long-term balanced diet. So we've done the fruit garden, fruit uh, concept in Indonesia, which is also currently being replicated in Madagascar. Uh, and it's amazing uh, because it, it is now providing you no know, more than rice, right? So, oh, their solutions are the best. And, and our job is just to respectfully hear them and figure out ways that we can transfer the wealth and the systems once again back to them. Thank you. Our next question. Hi, um, my name is Thomas. I'm in the Global Development MPS program. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming. And I um, really admire the sort of community centered approach. I wanted to ask about sort of the reciprocity aspect of the framework and how, how you're measuring both um, deforestation and impact. Um, and if so, if you are in fact measuring deforestation as part of that reciprocity agreement, what that methodology looks like and um, as far as impact, if there, if you see a big difference in impact, depending on the country in which you're working in. Um, so I'll try and answer your question as best because it's uh, got a lot of nuances. So reciprocity agreement is, is at its heart a very simple, it is, you know, a promise to pay for, uh, you know, in, in kind for the healthcare. Um, the idea of the reciprocity agreement is and it, it kind of changes the denomination. So because the whole goal is to protect the climate and the forest, right? So to, to little part, yes, we actually extensively study the forests, the trees. Uh, we work with the Department of Forests, uh, you know, and, and, and do an exhaustive analysis of the trees and everything before we even start working. So which is why, you know, it almost takes us six months to even set up the programs on the side because it takes us that long to understand the needs of the forests, do the radical listening and design the solution. So once that has been communally designed and agreed to with the community, that is how then the reciprocity agreement is designed. Um, in terms of measurement, yes, we absolutely measure. We've got the camera traps and everything. We also, that is why we work with the various universities. So we don't try to do it ourselves. We bring in our, our educational partners early on so that they can then help and go in and do, do it scientifically. So, uh, you know, we've been working with Stanford. I, I know the, the study I shared with you did all of that, but even though that is concluded, we are still working with them for doing the next round of analysis. So most of these carbon measurements and regrowth, they are like five-year marks. So you need a minimum of five years to be able to measure it in a meaningful way. So we definitely have all the metrics. We are constantly monitoring them. And really that is what our staff is doing. So. We've standardized some of them because we built a dashboard. So whether it's trees, it's carbon, it's uh, you know deep clearing, all of that has been measured and is constantly measured. Does that kind of answer your question? 
I mean, I could do a deeper dive, but I didn't want to make sure. He's nodding his head. So before I go to the next question, I would like to ask you myself uh, that Cornell University has quite a lot of resources here and capability. So maybe instead of that school that you mentioned that I, I don't quite remember, <laughs> please consider Cornell. There's quite a lot of talent in this space as well. Please. We would absolutely love to. We are constantly looking for partnerships uh, and actually trying to do it. So in fact, for Madagascar, we've just launched a massive One Health study which is looking at how community solutions can, uh, which is a 10 year study, I should clarify, uh, can, uh, can prevent future pandemics and zoonotic spillovers. And we are already partnered with the CDC who will be doing all the impact analysis. But Thank yes. you, that was partly a joke. <laughs> Thanks, go ahead. Hi, my name is Kelly. I'm a, a master's student in global development. And my question is, how did your organization initially find these communities to partner and engage with? Perfect question. Thank you, Kelly. So honestly speaking, our founder, Kinuri Webb, you know, went, as a, went to the Indonesian Borneo to see the orangutans, right, back in 2006. And everywhere she went, she heard these chainsaws, right? And it bothered her because the air was filled with the chainsaw. So she didn't go looking to find the solution. And that is when she actually stopped and asked someone like, why are these people cutting these trees? Why am I hearing all these chainsaws? What's going on here? And, and so started literally you know, the process of radical listening. And she talked to them and she was deeply upset by it. And she thought, right, right. So, so it's so straightforward. Why can't we just give them the healthcare solution? So she came back and went to Yale and while she was at Yale, she set up um, ASRI, which is our sister organization in Health and Harmony here in the US, um, to, to, you know, in Sukadana to work with the people in the Gulpanag National Forest. So really that was our starting point. Now, having said that, after that, it's, there are only so many you know, places where there are rainforests and we actually work with the communities and see where the problems are uh, to find a site. Oftentimes, actually people will hear and, and ask us, so we'll go and listen and, and work with the communities and actually suss out to see if that makes sense. So it is, ours is a long and involved process, but having done the initial proof of concept and site, now we understand the model, we understand we can replicate it um, and we can fine tune it. And that's really what we're about now. So now we want to just make a you know, platform and path to scale so that we can give that knowledge away to whoever wants to implement it in whichever community. Because really radical listening applies to everybody whether you're a corporate, whether you're a development organization or you're working in a rainforest community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mire. I'm a master's student in global development. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions regarding Brazil. Um, you, I think it's a very bold move to start a new location during the pandemic. And I would like to know a little bit more about um, how you adapted the original radical listening um, model to the pandemic situation. You uh, mentioned a little bit about WhatsApp, but I'd like to know a little bit more about how you adapted the operation um, to start a new location during the pandemic. And my second question is, um, you mentioned that it was a little different situation in Brazil because there are land grabbers. Um, I think in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that the community was more of a threat to the tropical rainforest. Community use was more of a threat than having a multinational co corporation logging. So I was wondering if um, in, in Brazil, is the health and harmony model still focusing on community a solution? Is it still effective in, in Brazil when there's land grabbers and there, it, there seems to be a lot more like bigger things going on outside of the communities as a threat to the rainforest? Neri, thank you for your questions. So yes, we had to be very, very creative. But again, because we always work with the local population and the local people, right? All our programs are headed by local staff, right? It's always the local people. So our first point for radical listening, I mean, we had the local people there, right? So they went by boat and we tied up with ISA, which is one of the most respected um, organizations working in Brazil. So we worked with ISA and I'm already right off the bat, understood with them what they've done, what their challenges are. Because anybody who tells you that they work in the Amazon by themselves, I don't know. I don't think that's ever going to be super effective. So 
we didn't go alone, but we worked with them. We use their networks, we use their connections. And our own staff is, is located in Altamira. So, you know, so that they can go into the Shingo River Basin easily. We also tied in with the Cantinas Network, uh, which is a series of networks all over. So to help our, you know, these people who we trained in radical listening, we used, you know, we established, in, we, they went and established internet points because that's what a lot of communities told us. They said, you know, we would, we would like to be able to communicate, right? When we have an emergency, we would like to be able to reach out and, and have the facilities. So it was a lot of it initially was about establishing those internet points so that we could reach them, they could reach us and that we could train our, um, the local community leaders that we were working with in radical listening so that then they could go and conduct radical listening with the communities uh, themselves. So that was the adaption of the radical listening model, if that makes sense. I mean, land grabbers and other problems are not unique to Brazil. They exist everywhere. It's just that Brazil is now more in focus. And th that's the thing, the rainforest communities themselves, they're amazing. You know, th so they don't, the, the, the adaption for us was they want to stay on their land to protect their land. So, so for us, this, the adaption was to say, okay, we will, we will bring the healthcare to you. So whether it's by boat, so we send the missions in because unfortunately many of those places are only accessible by boat. So we send the missions in every month and they go and then they, you know, they provide um, the uh, other vaccinations, the dental care, the family planning, the you know, COVID vaccinations, it's always the same ask, uh, you know, diagnosis. And then um, if needed, because of the internet points, they can communicate with us. So we had an emergency where a little three-year-old had to be airlifted. So we could send the helicopter in because that's the kind of emergency service that region needs and get them out. Do we have threats? Yes. Do we do advocacy? Completely. But we are working with the local organizations and that's the network, right? Because by, by one voice can be a little lonely, a group of us, not as lonely, and we can be heard. So we are making the difference. And we have a lot of foundation support. One final question from here. And if anybody online has a question, just uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be getting to you. Thank you for your presentation. I am Inongena Rex, a graduate student in Africana Studies. What I wanted to find out from you is, does your organization think about a possible unintended effect of this method in the sense that these communities were providing a service to the logging industry. And in the community now where you work, they no longer do logging. Won't that market shift to another community where you don't work and the logging still goes on? Is, does your organization cater for such effects? Oh, absolutely. So we, we don't try and, the, it, it would defeat the purpose if the logging shifted to another community. So your question is absolutely spot on. No, and the idea is, and so that's the part of the logging, if people start changing their lifestyles and footprints, which honestly, all of us need to, because we have less than a decade left, right? If we want to meaningfully convert and prevent that 1.5 degree rise on the earth's surface. So while that is happening, no. So in, we haven't seen a shift in logging because we are continuously monitoring the entire area, right? The footprint along with the government and everything. So. To our knowledge and to the best of our records, that logging has not shifted. So has it gone to another part of the world? That I can't say, right? But for this part of the world, for this biodiversity, which is critical, no, it hasn't shifted to other parts because we are definitely rapidly shifting this model into pretty much, you know, our goal is to protect the entire 1.3 billion rainforest cover of the earth. So we definitely don't want it shifting and we are doing our best to make sure it isn't shifting within the country borders. Uh, thank you very much, Devika. There's not many questions online. There's only one comment there that I'm paraphrasing here that how, how your radical listening approach is so dramatically different from Norman Borlaug's mantra of take it to the farmer. And Norman Borlaug gets quite a lot of respect in these circles, I should say. And uh, should it have been Listen to the farmers. Should Norman Bolog have been saying, listen to the farmers? 
for us at Health in Harmony, we believe in the anti-colonial approach. So we think that whatever the communities are doing, they know the solution. So we don't want to go with our anti-colonial, colonial mindset of saying we have a solution and this is how it should be done. Our mantra is, you know the solution, you've been doing it right for centuries. Please share that wisdom with us and tell us how to invest in your wisdom. Devika, on behalf of the Cornell community here and everybody in the room, I must say that you really got us thinking and thank you very much for a very stimulating talk. Thank you for the great work that you're doing to serve uh, people around the world in the rainforest and environment. We hope that you consider us as a potential partner. And I just want to say for everybody here, if you can put your hands together to thank our speaker today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It was an honor to present to all of you.